it was time to move on. My SUV was parked in a long-term parking lot at the airport. I figured that would give me about two weeks before anyone noticed the car had been parked there too long. I headed toward the Delta terminal carrying only my briefcase and travel bag. The briefcase contained all my documents, a few thousand dollars in various bills, and my travel documents. Everything looked perfectly normal, unless you really knew me. All the documents were in a different name, but where pictures were required, it was my face. Including my driver's license and passport. I was starting a new life with a new identity. I entered the terminal and began to go through security to board my flight. TSA is very efficient. They checked my ticket, x-rayed my briefcase, wallet, and car keys. There were no bombs, water bottles, or other prohibited items in my briefcase or on my person. They made an unmistakable determination that I was not a terrorist and let me through. Next stop is the men's restroom, where I go into a stall and start taking off my outerwear. Underneath is another set of clothes. I turn from a dressed businessman into a tourist returning from vacation. I am now wearing a garish shirt, shorts, and summer shoes. I step out of the men's room and blend in with the passengers on the flight returning from Las Vegas. I look like another tourist returning from the entertainment city. I follow the crowd to baggage claim. I walk up to a small wheeled suitcase standing alone on the conveyor belt. Since no one pays any attention to the suitcase, I grab it and walk out the doors to the exit. I walk over to the interterminal transport and climb aboard. Ten minutes later, I get off the streetcar at another terminal. I stop at the men's restroom, take off another layer and put it in the stolen suitcase. I walk up to the ticket counter, check my stolen bag, use one of my new IDs, and pick up my boarding pass. Instead of going through the TSA checkpoint, I head to the area where all the stores are. I get lost in the crowd and slowly make my way to the exit. Soon I am back on the streetcar and heading towards the Continental Terminal. This time I'm actually going to get on the plane and leave the airport. Soon I find myself on one of their overseas flights. I have successfully transformed into a different person. Now my new life begins. My wife, a cheating bitch, will never find me or my money. I guess I'd better tell you what prompted this identity change exercise. First, let me tell you about myself. I was born in western New York State in 1960. I graduated from high school about halfway through my junior year. I was not impressed with my scholastic ability or my physical fitness. You could say I was just an average kid. My parents were not wealthy professionals. My mom stayed at home and my dad worked in construction. I attended a local college and lived at home. During my studies, I worked part-time at a fast food joint, and during summer vacations, I worked with my dad in construction. My grades in college weren't outstanding. I just managed to get a 2.6 GPA all four years. Because I was working a lot, I didn't work hard enough to study. I was making enough to make ends meet. I got my business degree and went out into the world to make a name for myself. What was my surprise when none of the big guys wanted to hire me? I guess my average grades from a simple business program in an average college didn't set me apart from all those superstar graduates. So I spent my time looking for a job rather than getting a high-profile position. I finally found a job with a small property management company. I was not given a private office with a secretary. They gave me a desk, a phone, and a bunch of responsibilities for little startup money. My dreams of a white shirt, dark suit, and a 9-to-5 job in college were gone. I soon realized that everyone in small business is a jack of all trades. I've chased tenants for overdue rent, helped evictions, and interviewed prospective tenants. I've even helped the maintenance staff clean and paint for new tenants. I didn't make a lot of money, but I learned the real estate business by doing everything. And in the process, I fell in love. Not with a beautiful woman, but with the real estate business. My boss, the owner of the company, noticed my growing love for business and steered me in the right direction. He had several grown children, but none of them wanted to follow in his footsteps. I guess I became the child he had always dreamed of. Someone to whom he could pass on his knowledge. One day he called me into his office. 
Billy, look at these bank seizures and tell me what you think might be a good investment for us, he said. I've never done this sort of thing before, I excused myself. Don't worry, I'll look into your recommendations before I decide to go ahead with this. Oh, I'd like to get your results right after lunch. Lunch at his company was at 12 o'clock noon, and now it was almost 10 o'clock. Damn, he didn't give me much time, I thought. I skipped lunch and spent the next three hours reading the ads. I found a few that I thought he might like. Promptly, at one o'clock in the afternoon, I walked into his office and presented my recommendations. He listened to me for almost an hour before interrupting, so far everything you've chosen is crap, was his only comment. Come over here and I'll show you how it's done, he added. We spent the rest of the week making our selections. When we were done, we chose a few sites that had a lot of potential. I learned a lot that week. I also learned that my humble boss was a real estate genius. He bid on four bids and won only one. It was a four-family house built in the early 1910s. It was next door, on the edge of an upscale neighborhood populated by young marrieds and college students. The building needed a lot of work, but we bought it very cheaply, and the bank agreed to make all the construction loans and defer the mortgage payments for six months. We ended up buying the building for next to nothing and got all the money we needed to renovate it. At closing, he handed me the keys and said, this is your project. Start tomorrow. Over the next six months, I experienced more emotions than a human being should. I went from highs to lows and then back again. In between, I learned more and more about the apartment rental business. By the time the first mortgage payment came due, I had rented out all the apartments and was well on my way to a successful career. Shortly afterward, my boss surprised me again. Bill signed these papers for that four-family house we bought. Sure, but why? I asked. Because I'm transferring ownership to you, it's your building now. What? exclaimed I. Bill, I'm getting old and would like to pass on my knowledge to someone. I hope you will allow me to pass them on to you. My children will probably sell off all the property I own after I die, which is their birthright. So we will start your own real estate business. Please accept my little gift. That's how I got started. I soon became Bilco Properties, LLC. My friend and mentor died about five years later. As predicted, his children sold everything. They wanted the maximum price for everything and found a buyer who was willing to pay it. By that time I had 15 properties of my own. All of them were in good neighborhoods and were fully leased. My financial plan was based on 50% rent. By that I mean that if half of a building is rented out, it pays for all the costs of that building. Most of my buildings were 100% occupied. I wasn't rich, but I wasn't poor either. I was doing fine. I grabbed some commercial real estate when the guy who bought my late boss's business went bankrupt. He thought hiring a bunch of assistants and then spending all his time on the golf course was all it took. To my delight, he was wrong. I was 30 years old when I met the woman who eventually became my wife. I had bought a commercial property in a pretty nice neighborhood. She and her friend rented one of the offices to start a decorating business. When they met me, I was dressed as usual as one of the other employees. They were both dressed upscale, straight out of a fashion magazine. I guess, as interior decorators, they needed to make an impression. Well, they made one for me. Wendy was the more aggressive partner, she won my heart. In my imagination, she was standing in front of a vine-covered cottage with two small children, waiting for her husband to return from work. I imagined myself in that husband's shoes. When I told them the amount of rent, it was clear from their faces that they couldn't afford it. Since this is a fairly empty building, I lied, there was only one other vacancy, I can give you a provisional lease for the first year, I offered. How much lower? They asked in unison. About half, if that's not too much. The owner gives me a little leeway in setting introductory rates. They jumped at my generosity and signed a one-year lease with an option to renew for another year, rent to be determined later. Can we get the owner's name and address so we can thank him, asked Wendy. I gave them my mother's maiden name with an assumed name and the company's P.O. box. I explained that the owner didn't like to be disturbed, so a short note would suffice. 
Over the next year, I helped them with all their problems, dressed as a simple laborer. I watched their small business gradually grow. By the beginning of the second year, they renewed their lease at a higher rate. But the rate was still about 25% lower than what all the other tenants were paying. Like I said, they were very nice. One day Wendy, that's the one I liked, informed me that her partner was getting married and was going to move with her new husband to the west coast before her lease was up. She asked, can I terminate the lease? I don't think I can afford it when my partner leaves. I don't know about breaking the contract, but I can lower the rent to the same level as before. My boss doesn't like empty office space. I didn't really want her to leave. Her face lit up with a wide smile, and I received a kiss. That kiss was decisive for me, I was in love. After we parted, she looked at me differently and smiled in a special way. That was the beginning of our relationship. A year later, I stood at the altar and took my vows. By the time we were married a year later our daughter was born. Wendy had a difficult pregnancy and birth. Her doctor recommended that she not have any more children. She had her tubes tied. Our sex life remained as good as ever, but her desire for sex had diminished. Mine hadn't. I found myself going to bed with an erection, and a week later I still had the same erection. As I said, Wendy's sex drive had diminished. Since then, Wendy has been putting all her energy into her business. She never realized that I was more than a mere servant for some rich owner. She began to treat me without much respect. She began to see herself as the main breadwinner in the family. I tried to tell her that I actually owned a bunch of real estate, but she wouldn't give me a chance. Every time I started to tell her, I got, I don't want to hear about your work. It's boring. I accepted her opinion of my worth in order to keep the family together. She was still beautiful and I was still just average. By accepting her humiliation, I was able to keep a beautiful wife and daughter. My daughter soon became the love of my life. If I wasn't working on a real estate deal, I was spending every spare minute with my daughter. Watching this little girl grow up was my only reason for staying alive. Wendy and I just drifted apart. She was being drawn away from me by rich and powerful clients. But I continued to buy real estate. Some properties I left for a long period of time, and others I quickly resold, getting a tidy sum. I was slowly making a fortune that she knew nothing about. Wendy became more and more contemptuous of me and more and more aloof. Soon I was sent to sleep in the spare bedroom. The reasons for my banishment were listed as snoring too much, tossing and turning and disturbing her sleep and, of course, smelling like a petty servant. At first, I was allowed to visit her bed weekly, but over time that decreased and I became lucky if it happened once a month. The only reason I tolerated it was because of my daughter. If I confronted Wendy and she divorced me, everyone knows the mother gets the baby and the husband gets the bills. I love my daughter too much to put up with a selfish wife cutting her out of my life. I channeled my frustration and loneliness into my real estate business. I ran my company like a secret mission with great passion. I had interlocking corporations, multiple PO boxes, different office fronts, and most of my employees worked in different buildings. There were only two people in my main office, my trusty accountant and me. Everyone but my accountant considered me just another employee. I never corrected their misconceptions. By the time my daughter Amy was 15 years old, I owned about $25 million worth of real estate that was not mortgaged and another $50 million that had some form of mortgage debt hanging on it. They were in different corporate names at different addresses of those corporations. All the rents went into different P.O. boxes. Some of the rent disappeared into offshore accounts to avoid taxes. By this time, I was starting to make some serious money. I owned almost a hundred properties. These were no longer the simple three and four family houses I had started with. They were large residential complexes, shopping centers, commercial office space in 10-20 story buildings, and one large shopping center. Over the years, Amy and I grew close. I was the parent who was always there for her. If she was playing sports, I cheered for her in the stands, if she was sick, I sat by her bedside and held her hand. She and I would spend hours together at the mall, buying all those things a mother and daughter would normally buy. 
Except Amy's mom was too busy with her wonderful life, and I had to fill in for our daughter. By then, Wendy was also doing well in her business. Since I never bragged or changed my lifestyle, she still considered herself the main money earner in the family. I never corrected her because I didn't want her to think I had money and divorce me. My wife looked at me as if I was nothing more than a loser taking away from her success. She no longer hid her contempt for me. To become a second-class citizen in our home, I had to be promoted. Having come to terms with her attitude toward me, I began hiding more and more of my wealth abroad. When Wendy decided to upgrade, I didn't want to be penniless. Wendy's business as a decorator required her to hire very artistic people. I guess I was a little homophobic because those guys annoyed me. Wendy noticed that I was bothered by them and tried to make my life miserable every time I was in her office, she went out of her way to make the gayer ones my helpers. The boys had a hard time keeping their hands to themselves. Wendy just enjoyed those times. I didn't. It was another way for Wendy to demonstrate her contempt for me. But I accepted her treatment. To stay married and with my daughter, I had turned into a wuss. Wendy's story. My husband Bill was a nice enough guy, but he had no ambition. I, on the other hand, was driven to succeed, always trying to improve our lives. Bill just held me back. Okay, he was a regular lover and father of an only child. He treated our daughter like a princess. He was always there for her. But he did nothing for me. I wonder what I saw in him. He was just average. He settled for a dead-end job working for a reclusive real estate giant as a longshoreman. He was always a nice guy when I started my business with my friend Millie. He was like the landlord's governess. I was able to wrap my head around him and get all sorts of concessions on the rent, as well as a lot of extras. In the second year of our business, Millie and I decided we weren't meant to be partners. I was aggressive. If the client was male, I flirted and let him know he had a chance to get in my panties if he provided his business. If the client was female and curious, I satisfied her curiosity for the sake of her business. Millie wasn't me. She had morals. I liked to fool around. I broke up with Millie before the end of my second year. She left with her boyfriend for the West Coast. I was so bad to her that she just walked away, leaving me the business and all the assets. I gave her nothing in return. I was a little worried about whether I could pay all the rent on my fancy office space without Millie's help. So I turned my feminine charms on Bill. I got the rent reduced for another year. In gratitude and as a tease, I kissed him for the first time. But after the kiss, I discovered that I liked kissing him. I don't know exactly why, but my panties got wet from that kiss. Maybe it was because I hadn't had a good session with either a man or a woman in over a month. I guess I was a little needy. For all of Bill's negative aspects, he was a very good lover. Bill was very attentive. As the old saying goes, lady first was always his goal. He made sure that I was always satisfied before he let himself come. I was used to inattentive lovers. Men who only cared about their own pleasure, leaving me unsatisfied most of the time. My mistresses very rarely satisfied me. I did not love women except to win their business. I always made sure they were satisfied, ignoring my own satisfaction, but that was business. But Bill was so boring outside the bedroom. He wasn't up to date on current events, popular authors, artists, or other famous people. If anyone tried to strike up a conversation with him at a party, they soon gave up. Bill could only discuss real estate and accounting. And those were two topics that bored most of my friends to death. I tried to take him to the opera, to concerts at the Philharmonic and to contemporary plays. All that worked was that I struggled to keep him awake, because if he snored, I wouldn't be ashamed. Since I was in the decorating business, I had to attend various charity events to promote myself and get noticed. When I brought Bill to these events, he usually just sat at our table and made no contribution to the evening. He didn't even dress very nicely. He was more of a liability than an asset. I probably should have worked on his image, but I was too busy expanding my business. One day I received an invitation to a charity event. This time I didn't tell Bill until it was too late for him to change his earlier plans. 
Bill, I'm going to this event even if you can't attend. It's important to my business, and you know I'm responsible for our standard of living. I objected. But Wendy, wouldn't it look bad if you came alone? asked Bill. I'll take one of my decorators with me. He'll be conspicuously gay enough that no one will mistake him for a lover. It was at this event that I met James, the man who would become my lover. I stood at one of the bars looking for my bow. I suspected he'd snuck off with one of the other gay men at the party, leaving me to my fate, when this handsome man struck up a conversation with me. Pardon me, but I couldn't help but notice that your escort has left you, James said. My name is James William Hawthorne, and I would like to enjoy your company this evening, if you will allow me. The first thing that came to my mind was, God, he's gorgeous. He was well-dressed, well-spoken, and looked wealthy. I accepted his offer to spend the evening. We spent time together. In the cab on the way home, I noticed that I felt a little wet between my legs. I knew that this time it wasn't Bill who was causing this sensation, but James. I wondered how James would fay. L between my legs. Will he be man enough to see it through? My husband Bill loved me and worshipped the center of my womanhood until I screamed with pleasure. But the rest of the time, Bill was just boring. About a week later, James called me, Hi, Wendy. Would you like to join me for lunch? I have an office and thinking of remodeling, and I'd like your opinion. That's how it started. Within a month we became lovers. We started meeting two or three times a week after lunch in different hotels. He was my lover. I don't want to say he was better than Bill, but Bill always thought of my pleasure first. James never did. James treated me like a whore and Bill treated me like a queen. James was interesting, even if he used me as a sexual object. He made me do things that Bill would never think of doing. There were days when I was hurt by all the things James made me do. I loved the humiliation, the fact that I was treated like a slut, a common whore. I was the submissive woman and he was the dominant man. I was born to give him every pleasure. For James, I could never refuse him anything. I was bored with Bill's tender love. I wanted to dominate James. I was completely at his mercy. He even started bringing other men into our bed. He shared me with his friends. With additional men in our bed, my orgasms were as intense as I had ever experienced. I didn't want it to stop. So I decided I wanted my own apartment. One where James and I could spend all our free time together. So I devised a plan and put it into action. Bill, I began, I'm going to rent an apartment in town. I'm spending too much time commuting between my office and this ugly farm. It's almost an hour one way, and I could better spend that time working. I know you love this farm, but I need to be closer to the city. You and Amy can stay here. There's no need to disrupt your lives. But Wendy, he began. I interrupted him, this is non-negotiable. I've already made up my mind. I've already chosen one of the two options, and by the end of the month I'll be moving. I saw the resentment in Bill's eyes. Don't worry honey, I'll still come home on the weekends for you and Amy. I got busy with my plans. James helped me choose a very prestigious apartment a few minutes from my office. To make Bill feel involved, I showed him the apartment and asked him if he approved of my choice. Before he could answer, I said, I knew you would like it too. I'm using it to emphasize my decorating skills. As we left the building, I noticed that the property manager knew Bill. I just assumed that they had met at some real estate event that Bill regularly attended. That day, Wendy rented an apartment in the city so she wouldn't have to drive every day to our house out of town, as she said. I realized that my marriage was over. I'd suspected she had a lover, but until now I hadn't been sure. Now I was sure. Wendy never knew I owned this house. It was one of the more upscale houses. My manager saw me and wanted to talk but I pretended we were only acquaintances, not employer and employee. Later he talked to me about my wife and her lover. My heart broke. I guess I still loved Wendy, but I didn't know how I would survive this transgression of hers. The only thing I could do was to gather enough evidence of her cheating and poor moral character for me to become a guardian. 
My manager told me that my wife and her lover picked out the apartment together, and he filled out the application with her. They rented the apartment together. It was their love nest. He and I decided to get the apartment video and audio wired before Wendy could move in. I had more than enough money to pay for the work and install the equipment in the manager's office. Residents thought a new security system was being installed in the building. This time I made sure Wendy paid the full rent. It was actually a little higher than the other apartments. But since her current boyfriend was paying the rate, I didn't care. I made sure the apartment was in our name, because I didn't want some vigilant lawyer to claim that the information I'd gathered through video and audio recordings was inadmissible in court. I started gathering evidence for the divorce. Since Wendy had actually moved out of our house, my monthly visits to her bedroom had stopped. She promised she would be home on weekends, but never did. I have become very good friends with the five sisters and my hand cream purchases have really increased. When Wendy decided to anoint our daughter Amy and I with a weekend home visit, Amy was thrilled to have her mom around again. Amy was at the age where she needed her mom around. She needed to socialize with a woman, have girl talk and all that. Dad didn't come around anymore. Amy started idolizing her mother and Wendy's lifestyle. I figured it was just a phase Amy was going through, so I played alone. I didn't realize how wrong I was. When Wendy did bless me with a visit to my bed, I couldn't perform anymore. I kept watching videos of her lover and listening to the sounds of their sex. She let her lover do everything to her. She was acting like his slave. I heard him belittle me as he fucked her and she agreed with him that I was incomplete as a lover and a man. Bill, what's wrong with you? She asked after trying unsuccessfully to get me an erection. We haven't had sex in months and you can't even get an erection. If I didn't know better, I'd swear you had a girlfriend. I'm sorry, Wendy, but I have too much on my mind to perform. I'll do it better next time. I promise. The next time never came. Wendy's boyfriend would send her rent checks to a P.O. box, where they would eventually come to me. I copied them and put the originals in the bank. A lot of you are wondering why I didn't get back at him while he was fucking my wife. Don't be disappointed, I did. The bank manager I did business with for my company was a good friend of mine, and also a good friend of the bank manager of my wife's lover's bank. Just for the sake of interest, we started keeping an eye on his finances. We soon realized that he was living too close to the edge and wanted to help him. After a couple months, we noticed a pattern in his finances. He seemed to be a little short of money every couple of months and depended on the floating time between deposits and withdrawals to stay afloat. His accounts were short on cash and if my wife's rent checks came into the account at certain times of the month, they would be returned for insufficient funds or, even better, result in several of his wife's checks being returned for insufficient funds. Get the point? So we started playing games with his accounts. Soon he not only began receiving fines from my company for return checks and late rent, but he was also paying bank fees for checks written by his wife that were also returned. Soon many of her checks, to her embarrassment, began bouncing at her favorite stores. Even some of her friends started asking her for cash if they split a check for lunch. Our plan was working perfectly. Because of all those returned checks and fees, his credit rating was lowered. This did not please his credit card companies. Although they didn't close his accounts, they used a different method. They permanently lowered his credit limit to exactly the amount he owed, effectively removing his ability to pay anything. This also affected his wife's use of joint cards. As you can imagine, this made her a little upset, because no woman wants to have her credit card declined. I enjoyed those times. Not only was he getting $200 to $300 late fees and return checks, he still had to explain to his wife how these mistakes happen without mentioning that my wife's apartment complex and their depositing habits were to blame. I bet there were some interesting conversations about family finances in his house. The next break was sent to me from heaven. My wife went to the doctor for female problems. A swab taken from her revealed that she had some form of cancer. Our relationship by then was such that she didn't tell me anything about it. She only told me that she was having female problems and needed surgery. The truth came out when my then 17-year-old and 18-year-old daughter Amy let the cat out of the bag. 
She told me she was going to stay with her mother. Why Amy? I asked. Have I been such a bad father to you? No, Dad, you didn't see it, but Mom needs me. She has ovarian cancer. And you don't love her anymore, but I still do. I want to help Mom get through these months until she gets better. I missed my daughter, but I needed to finalize my plans. If Amy chose to be with her mother over me, so be it. As much as I wanted my daughter to be with me, she chose her mother. I think she really needed to help her mother become complete. Amy was all grown up now. Plus, living with her mother might have exposed Amy to what a slut her mother really was. The following Sunday I went to church. It had been many years since I had set foot in the house of the Lord, but I wanted to take the time to thank him. That's right, I wasn't praying for Wendy's recovery, I was thanking the Lord for delivering her from cancer. It was the nicest thing he could do for me. Wendy was suffering and her lover was paying full price but getting nothing in return. He cleaned up Wendy's vomit, watched her hair fall out, watched her lose weight and become more of a Halloween decoration than a person. On one of the tapes, I saw how he treated Wendy. He would leave her lying in her own filth until he was ready to help her. Amy must have noticed this, because she was the one who took care of her mother. I made an appointment with a lawyer. I explained that I wanted to get out of the marriage without any financial loss other than his fees. I also wanted him to make sure the lover's wife got all the information she needed to get him out. He told me, as usual, that this was a no-fault state in ever. You thing would be split 50 fiftieths. Not a chance, I thought. I had other plans. I left all the video and audio evidence, as well as copies of all the rent checks paid by my wife's lover through his account, and the rental application signed by lover and Wendy. I wanted him to collect all the paperwork, but not file it until I said so. The next step was to sell off all of my real estate. It had to be done slowly because I didn't want to depreciate my assets too much. I was very fortunate in this endeavor. First, the real estate market was booming and several real estate firms were entering our market. As the new firms competed with each other, they were constantly getting into bidding for some of my best properties. I usually ended up getting more than I expected. I was very satisfied. In the meantime, I slowly cleared the house of all our personal belongings and sold it. The closing was scheduled for the day after my wife received the summons. After about six months, I signaled my lawyer to give my lover's wife everything she needed to divorce him. He moved into my wife's apartment with my wife and daughter after my wife kicked him out. They were a happy family until they realized they had no money. His wife froze all his assets and I made sure my wife's accounts were transferred to my offshore accounts. They were both as poor as church mice. One day my property manager Phil called from my wife's apartment and left a message for me. It said, check out the video I'm sending you today. Your daughter is in trouble. I stopped watching videos from Wendy's apartment months ago. My lawyer said we had more than enough evidence of her cheating for a divorce. So naturally I was concerned when I got a call from Phil, my property manager. After lunch, a courier delivered the disc. The disc was arranged chronologically. It started about four months ago. It started with lover drugging my daughter and raping her. Amy cried for hours, but she wouldn't leave. All she kept saying was, why did you let this happen, mommy? The clips further showed lover getting my daughter hooked on crystal meth and using her as a sexual object. He beat her, humiliated her and used her for his vile sexual games. I watched my daughter sink into the life of an addict. She begged him to give her the cure. He would force her to have sex with him before giving her the medicine. Soon she was just stripping naked in the living room and waiting for him to start. He was sadistic and soon had Amy begging him not to hurt her. I watched the video taken in my wife's bedroom. She was awake and listening to Amy being raped. I saw tears in her eyes, but she did nothing to stop him. She was too subservient to him to resist his sadistic nature. She just lay there and let Amy satisfy her lust. The worst video was filmed one night when Loverboy brought a couple of very unpleasant-looking guys into the apartment. The three of them had rough sex with Amy for four to five hours. Amy passed out and the session ended after a few hours. 
They continued to use her body even though she was unconscious. In the video, one of the guys walks into Wendy's bedroom. Hey, mommy. You have a great daughter. She holds her head up really well. I try you, but you're too ugly right now. But don't worry, we'll be back to savor your daughter's sweet pussy, he bragged. Now it was too late to protect Amy from Loveboy and his friends. Amy was a willing partner as long as the drugs kept coming. These clips cover a time period of about four months. By the time I saw them, Amy was already hooked. It was too late to help my girl. I called my lawyer at four in the morning when I stopped crying and left him a message. The message asked me to save her. Get her out of that apartment before someone killed her. I knew she was over 18 and legally there was nothing I could do, but I had to try. Amy was still my little girl. Although I still didn't have any special feelings for Wendy, I couldn't ignore what was happening to our daughter. The next day he called me back on my voicemail. He said he would think about saving Amy, but she was an adult and there wasn't much he could do. Later that day, he called back. Alan reported that my 18-year-old daughter was pregnant and claimed that my wife's lover was the cause. He forced her to sell her body and kept her on drugs, crystal meth, so she wouldn't resist. He also added, one night when lover and Amy were working in the hotel bar, the client turned out to be an undercover police officer. Lover was arrested for contributing to the delinquency of a minor and numerous other prostitution and drug charges. I didn't think he would contest the charges, but I sent the tapes from Wendy's apartment to the police and the local media just in case. Thanks to the publicity the tapes generated, I was certain that Lovering would never work in this town again. In addition, the publicity gave his wife additional leverage to settle the divorce proceedings. A boy in love was in jail awaiting trial because he couldn't make bail. My daughter was also in jail because she didn't have money for bail. Alan, my lawyer, and I discussed Amy. Alan said that I should keep her in jail and he would make sure she was placed in a treatment program. He explained that if I bailed her out, she would just become another drug addict on the street. It would be better to leave her where she could get treatment and he could keep an eye on her. Later that day, I used the videotape and managed to Photoshop out only the men's faces. Three weeks later, they were found beaten to death in the alley behind their favorite bar. Luckily for him, Loverboy was in jail or he would have joined them in death. You see, one of the spaces in my store was rented by some guys with ties to organized crime. They were supposed to do me a favor. At the same time, my wife was not paying any attention to her business while she was undergoing treatment. Several of her employees started their own decorating business, with my help, of course, and abandoned my wife, taking most of her clients. Her business failed and her landlord, guess who, evicted her from her office space. She was broke and had no source of income. There was no health insurance for her. She called me and asked me to put her on my policy, which I did. But the policy I had did not cover pre-existing medical conditions. I've always been able to plan ahead. So I moved to the present tense of my story. I was on an airplane to South America. There was no way to track me down. I soon landed in Cancun and made another identity change, taking a plane to Europe. In Europe, I would make another identity change and head for warmer climes. In this way, my wife would never be able to find me, nor would the local police if they were looking for me in connection with the beating. Before I left for Australia, I called my lawyer Alan. Alan informed me that my daughter, Amy, was trying to contact me. She wanted to reconcile with me. He told me that she had somehow found out about all my wealth. My lawyer told her that I was long gone and there was no way they could find me unless I wanted to be found. I told Alan to use some of my money to prepare Amy's defense. I also told him to keep her in jail as long as possible because while there she was making progress with her drug addiction. I felt that if she went back on the streets, she would go back to her old habits. From everything I was able to learn, crystal meth was a nasty drug. I learned that it usually takes three to four relapses before a person can get clean if they really want to. Six months later, I called my attorney to see what the status of my divorce was. The attorney informed me that no divorce was necessary. My wife had lost her battle with cancer and died before the divorce was final because she had no money and we were not divorced and I had taken over the cost of her care. 
She died in a charity ward in the hospital. She had no visitors while she was dying. She died alone and in agony. I paid all of her medical bills. I guess I did feel a little guilty. She was the love of my life, but her actions and greed had torn us apart. Yet she still held a small place in my heart. I was overseas, in hiding, and my daughter Amy was in prison when Wendy died. There was no funeral for Wendy. Alan said, her ashes are waiting at the county coroner's office for someone to collect them. If no one shows up to pick it up, she will be buried with other indigent people in an unmarked grave. Alan was silent, waiting for me to answer. I suppose he was waiting for me to suggest that I take responsibility for Wendy's remains. Not a chance in hell, I thought. She's caused me too much pain and humiliation over the years for me to forgive her now. I cajoled him and asked about his daughter. She lost her baby at four months due to an STD. She's in jail now, serving a 12-month sentence for prostitution and drug possession, but she's in a good drug treatment program and seems to be making progress. How about Loverboy? I asked. I already knew what had become of him because my friends had taken care of him for me, but I wanted to play dumb. He died in a yard fight in prison. They don't like criminals of his type in prison. If Amy asks you to settle her mother, give her the money she needs. If she is clean and drug-free, support her at my expense until she finishes her education and can support herself. If she's not clean, give her enough to overdose. Then bury them both in unmarked graves. I replied. I know it sounds harsh, but I'd rather my daughter die than a junkie on the street. If she had overdosed, she would have passed away without suffering. If she lived on the streets, she would still die, but at the hands of some pimp or pervert. I didn't want her to suffer if she couldn't overcome her addiction. But if Amy had managed to cope, recover, and stay drug-free, I think I'd make sure she had enough money for a second chance. Hell, I had. Millions, what's a few dollars to my kid? Maybe, just maybe, she'd be up to the task. For years had passed when I stopped in town to visit Alan, my old lawyer. We hadn't spoken in years. He was retiring and closing his practice. I wanted to stop by and wish him good luck in retirement and give him a monetary gift. He was a good friend of mine. Actually, he was my only friend, I was a lonely old man. Apart from him, no one cared whether I lived or died. As I drove my new Bentley around town, I experienced many memories. Some of them were pleasant, and some of them were. Well, you know. I took extra time to drive around town and visit some of the properties I once owned. Most of the neighborhoods I chose to buy condos had thrived over the years. My old properties looked pretty good. Most of my old commercial properties were also showing signs of increasing in value. Too bad my divorce from Wendy forced me to sell those properties and hide my wealth. I'd always thought that if I told Wendy about all my holdings, she might respect me more. But now it was too late for such an experiment. I parked in front of my lawyer's office and walked inside. The building was one of the few I still owned. I had kept it because it housed the lawyer's practice. I wanted to secure it so he could look out for my interests. I wanted to deed the building to him so he would have something to provide for his old age when he retired. It was my gift to him. Hello, old bastard, Alan, my lawyer, greeted me. To know a man, you have to know him, I replied. We hugged each other and shook hands. The years that had passed just disappeared as we both started telling each other about everything we had done over the years. When we finally slowed down, he said, aren't you going to ask about your daughter Amy? Not really, but I bet you'll tell me anyway. Actually, Bill, you'd be proud of her. When she was released from prison, she got into another drug rehabilitation program. She went through the whole program and then stayed on to work as a counselor. She overcame her addiction. Alan continued. Gee, the sarcastic part of me exclaimed. At the same time, the secret part of me was glad it had succeeded. No, really. Amy stayed there and also went into the social worker program at our local college. It worked out well for her. She finished the four-year program in three years. She's graduating next month, I informed her. 
Besides, you paid for everything. I loosely interpreted your instructions. One more thing, Bill, you should meet your son-in-law, Frank Murphy, and granddaughter, Vivian. The little one is almost seven months old now, and she's starting to develop personally. She's going to be a real beauty when she grows up. A real heartbreaker. Just like her grandmother, I thought. A real heartbreaker. Alan continued, you also paid for all their expenses beyond what his meager income covered. Including a nanny called Chloe. I put her in the apartment across the hall from the kids and had her pretend to be just a helpful neighbor who was bored with retirement and wanted to help out. Her constant presence as a nanny allowed Amy to continue her studies and Frank to get ahead in his job. I succumbed to the pressure and agreed to stay in town for the rest of graduation and watch what was going on. As graduation approached, Alan somehow arranged it so that we could attend not only the graduation ceremony, but also the events before and afterward. At one of the pre-graduation meetings, I noticed my daughter and her husband. I was amazed, for we hadn't seen Amy in years, and she had inherited her mother's beauty. I always knew my daughter inherited her mother's genes. But Amy turned out to be a real beauty. Amy looked like her mother, the only woman I'd ever loved. I felt a slight sadness in my heart. It looked like this graduation might be a little harder on me than I thought. I took my friend aside from the crowd and said, I don't want to interfere in Amy's life anymore. So don't expect me to run up and greet them, it's too hard. Promise me that. I promise, he replied. The next day, Alan and I were sitting about halfway up the bleachers. We heard the graduates being announced as they crossed the stage. Their parents and friends applauded or cheered as diplomas were handed out. When it was my daughter's turn, her husband stood with a baby in his arms. From my seat, I could see his tears. The applause for her was louder than the others. Pride was born in my heart. When my daughter reached the center, the dean stopped her. It is with great pleasure that I present this special award to you, Amy Murphy. You have been chosen by your fellow students and the institution for this distinction. Mrs. Murphy, you are being honored for unselfishly helping anyone who needed support. We all believe that because of your actions, this class has graduated more of your peers than any other class in the history of the school. The dropout rate since you have been a student here is virtually zero. Along with your diploma, you will find a certificate of appreciation signed by all members of this class as well as the school administration. Amy, we all love you and will miss you. When Amy crossed the stage, she received a standing ovation. I was prouder as a parent than I had ever been. I was probably more worried about her at that moment than when she was born. My baby girl turned out really well. I was happy for her. Once the ceremony was over, I headed back to my car. But because of all the students and visitors, the aisles were jammed. As I squeezed through the crowd, I tried to keep my head down so I wouldn't be recognized. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw my daughter, her husband, and my grandson walking down the aisle next to me. Shit, I thought. I need a hole to open up where I can crawl in and hide. I couldn't find such a hole and I was trapped. My daughter and her husband didn't notice me, but my granddaughter did. I watched her out of the corner of my eye as she watched my every move. She never left my son-in-law's neck as she watched me. By this time she was about nine months old and seemed to be out of sorts. In her childish voice, she began to chant, Bopa. That's what many children called their grandfathers. She began chanting, waving her arms and kicking her legs, trying to break free from her father's grip. Amy reached to take the child from her husband when she looked where the child was pointing. Not knowing me, Chloe showed her granddaughter a picture of me and tried to explain who I was. The child really learned her lesson. To her credit, Amy didn't scream or pass out. All she said was, Hi, Daddy. Thanks for coming and supporting us all these years. About a month ago, Alan told us about your involvement in our lives. I later learned that he had kept this little family under his protection for many years. He also informed Amy that it was my money that paid for her education and other expenses over the years. He played the role of the father that I could not, yet he gave me credit for it. I looked at her and smiled, I wouldn't miss your graduation for any tea in China. And paying your expenses was the least I could do. 
After all, I'm the one who left you alone. Amy's husband looked at me and stammered. He really didn't know how to behave at a reunion. I caught his arm for support. My granddaughter grabbed my shirt and started yelling, Bopa, Yupi. My daughter Amy spoke first, Vivian wants you to hold her, Daddy. Don't you want to coddle your granddaughter? Before I could make a decision, I had a very excited little girl in my arms. She was hugging my neck and telling everyone in my ear that I was Bopa. I was hooked. This little baby had worked his way into my heart. Suddenly I was a grandfather, father and father-in-law and I was enjoying every minute of it. Years of loneliness seemed to be over. My heart began to heal. Soon we were standing in one of the large parking lots with Alan, my attorney. Bill, let's get in your car and drive to a restaurant so you can get reacquainted with your family. We have a lot of years to get through. My brother-in-law, Frank, odd when he realized we were approaching a Bentley Mulsanne, a $300,000 car. He just stopped and stared at us with amazement on his face. I held out the keys to him, wanna drive, son? I asked. The glow from his grin eclipsed the lights in the parking lot. It looked like he wanted to drive. We drove across the lot to his old beat-up Ford to get a car seat and everything else required when traveling with a small child. I looked at the car and made a decision. He will get his own set of keys to the Bentley tomorrow. I'll buy my own other car later. As soon as we pulled away, I found myself sitting in the back seat next to my granddaughter, who was between Amy and me. Little Vivian was holding onto my hand and chatting with me like any small child would. A rather large lump formed in my throat. Dad, we have a lot to talk about, Amy said. I need to apologize to you. I was a stupid, selfish kid. I never realized how much I went out of my way to mom to hurt you. No, you don't need to apologize. I'm proud of you for turning your life around and now you have a beautiful little family. And I finally realized that you needed your mother all those years ago and she needed you too. I'm just sorry that you both were taken advantage of by that creep James. But dad. I interrupted her by saying, I would like to be a part of your new life if you agree. I too have made many mistakes in our relationship and would like to make it up to you. We have a lot to talk about. And I hope I never see that James again. He ruined my mother with his lies, and he ruined me with his perversions and drugs. If Frank hadn't found me, I'd still be in jail or dead from an overdose. It took me a fourth try before I overcame my addiction. It was because of Frank that I was able to do. So, his love helped me overcome the final hurdle. Now little Vivian is my reason to stay clean. As her mother, I have so much to share with her. Amy cried, but not out of sadness, but out of a sense of family throughout our trip. I think she finally felt complete. All through dinner, the next day at their apartment and the following days at my hotel we talked. In fact, we talked for the entire next month. We made peace with all those years of pain and loneliness. In the end we blamed all our problems on my late wife and her attitude towards me. We agreed that Wendy was a selfish person. She paid attention to nothing but her own desires. Wendy was beautiful on the outside, but empty on the inside. But I still missed her. I knew that no one on this earth would ever replace her in my heart. My daughter Amy realized that I wasn't the bad guy her mother had painted me to be, but just a man who was so much more than my late wife. At one point in our conversations, Amy looked at me and said, You still love her, don't you, Daddy? It still hurts when I think about how much she despised me, but you're right, I guess some part of me still loves her. I wasn't a weakling. I loved her with all my heart, but long ago she had hurt me to the core, and I did what I had to do to Wendy to save myself from ruin. My lawyer dropped a bombshell on us about two months after we reconciled. One day at dinner, he asked, what do you guys want me to do with Wendy's ashes? They've been sitting on a shelf in my office for a very long time. You could hear a pin drop at the table. The silence was broken by my granddaughter chanting, I want a grandmother. Amy and I looked at each other. Dad, I guess I thought that since I was in prison when she died, I would never get a chance to say goodbye to her. Now that I've met you and heard your story, there are a lot of things I want to say to mom. Some of them are not very nice. 
Can we go after her? Good, I guess. I'd like to say something to her, too. But I won't apologize for anything I did to her. After all the years of pain she put me through before she died, she deserved what I did to her. Dad, I'm not saying what you did was wrong. Don't forget I lived with her and that asshole who raped me and turned me into a drug addict. They deserved everything you did to them. And while we're on the subject, so do I. I was a bitch to you. I had to hit rock bottom in prison before I started to turn my life around when I realized what I did to you. Frank interrupted, Dad, I met her at the shelter where she worked as a counselor. I was in rehab there for a drinking problem. She was just coming back and at that moment I fell in love with her. She helped me get rid of my alcohol addiction and I supported her in trying to get clean. We haven't broken up since. In the end, we all agreed that Vivian should have some connection to her grandmother, even if it was just visiting the grave. It would also give Amy and me a chance to vent our anger at Wendy. Later that day, we picked up the urn from my lawyer's office. I put the urn in the trunk of the Bentley, remembering that Wendy never liked to ride in the back seat because she got carsick in the car. I hoped the trunk would enhance the effect. I guess I still had bad feelings for my wife. Epilogue We moved to Virginia and I bought a small farm near a major city. My son-in-law and I decided to raise a few horses and organize a small stable where city people could keep their horses and ride them in the countryside. Wendy's ashes will eventually be buried in a small family plot on our farm. This plot contained the remains of a family that lived here in the mid-1800s and once owned part of the property. We cleaned up the lot and put up a small fence to enclose it. We left room for a few additional graves. The last thing I did was set up a headstone for Wendy. It said. Wendy Adams. 1956-1995. to Cancer victim. She will be missed by all who loved her. We all forgive you. Over the years, I have noticed that my granddaughter often plays with her books in this little graveyard. One day I asked her why. Because grandma talks to me and helps me learn to read. She said it as if it was a completely normal phenomenon. Bapa, she says she's sorry she hurt you. Someday she will make it up to you. She also told me that now she sees what a good man you are and would like you to forgive her. She also asks if she can wait here, in the cold and dark, until it is your turn. Then she asks if you will let her come into the light with you. That way she can be with you forever. A little voice said in my head, that was a nice try, William, but I don't get carsick anymore. I fell to my knees and began to hug Vivian. Papa, why are you crying? 